All right. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, How Can I Use an LLC to Get the Best Tax Treatment with the Least Complexity, with our host, Wayne Zell. I'm Kat Parker, Marketing Director at Zell Law, and I'll be your co-host today. There will be a few polls throughout the presentation, and your answers will be anonymous, so feel free to answer honestly. We will also have a Q&A and a brief survey at the end of the presentation. Please chat me directly if you want to receive CE credit for this hour and we're unable to submit your CFP information through the Zoom webinar registration for any reason. And now I would like to turn it over to Wayne Zell, the founder of Zell Law, an estate and business planning law firm with offices in Reston, Virginia and Savannah, Georgia, serving clients nationwide. Thanks, Kat. It's great to see everybody. I can't really see you, but I know you're there. And thanks for taking time out from your busy schedules for a lunch and learn on how to use LLCs to get the best tax treatment and other treatment with the least complexity if possible. Now, avoiding complexity with LLCs is easy, but it's also easy to get involved in some complex structures, which we'll talk about at the very end from an estate planning perspective. So let's, let's get rolling. Today's agenda, six things we'd like to cover. Um, the uh, last bullet uh, doesn't look accurate, but under number six, but it's uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is what is an LLC and why we have to use it and why we should use it. Uh, number two, we're going to talk about what are the requirements for forming an LLC in any of the states. Um, we're going to focus on a mining company example on how an LLC becomes extremely useful and helpful uh, when you're dealing with a company that has uh, high potential liability based on the activities it's engaged in. We're going to talk about some of the major tax issues that arise with LLCs, and I'll, I'll divert and talk a little bit about some of the state and local income tax issues that we face with LLCs and partnerships. And then I'll compare an S-Corp to an LLC. Um, of course, as you know from participating in prior sessions, if you have, LLCs can be taxed as S-Corps. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And the last bullet was really intended to talk about a complex structure involving a family LLC and trusts. And so we'll get into that at the very end. All right, Wayne, we do have our first quick poll. We are just a little curious to know how many of you guys how many LLCs have you set up? Uh, less than two, two to five, or over five? All right, and the results. It's pretty evenly spread across the board. Um, many of you have only set up one or two. Um, a chunk of you have set up between two and five, and a, a big percentage of you have set up more than five LLCs, which is uh, is interesting. I'd love to hear about your your experiences in that regard. What is an LLC? Well, an LLC is a hybrid form of entity that really didn't appear in the United States until 1987. And in 1987, Wyoming was the first state to enact an LLC statute. And following Wyoming, virtually, not virtually, all 50 states and the District of Columbia enacted their own versions of an LLC statute um, all the way up until about 1997, 1998, when the last statutes were uh, being enacted. And so... They're now everywhere, they're ubiquitous and they're used everywhere. But before 1987, LLCs were being used a similar uh, type of entity like a limited company or a similar type of entity was being used in Europe heavily for many, many decades. And so we got the idea from the Europeans as well as from the Caribbean which uh, uses LLCs or limited companies very heavily. And as I mentioned, and the statutes vary from state to state, but an LLC basically offers the same advantages as a corporation, 
while at the same time avoid, avoiding the corporate income tax rules if you want to avoid them. A member of an LLC, which is the investor in the LLC, it's not referred to as a shareholder, it's a member of the LLC, is not liable for the debts of the LLC beyond their investment in the entity. Now, if you've committed to make additional investments in the entity by signing on to some type of subscription agreement with a private equity firm or something like that, you're also liable to the extent of your commitments to put more money into the entity later on. So if you've signed a contract, a binding contract, you can be held liable to that extent. The beauty of the LLC is that it's less complex to set up. It's simpler to set up than a corporation. And it still offers this limited liability protection. But it's classified with two or more members automatically as a partnership for tax purposes, at least for federal income tax purposes, unless you elect to treat it otherwise. So that means that losses that are incurred at the entity level, at the LLC level, can be passed through to the members and deductible by the members under the partnership tax rules. And that's helpful because if you have invested money into the entity, or you've borrowed money, or you've guaranteed borrowing for the entity, you get to claim income tax basis and claim losses to offset that basis. From an estate planning standpoint, a major advantage of the LLC as well as a partnership over a C corporation or an S corporation is that when a partner or a member of the LLC dies, the partnership or the LLC can elect to adjust the income tax basis of the assets inside the entity. So if we had written off a bunch of assets inside the LLC from depreciation or amortization expenses. And then the founder of the LLC or one of the owners dies. The entity can elect to step up the tax basis of the assets inside the LLC, including goodwill, to the extent of the decedent's ownership interest. So if I was a member, I passed away, I owned 50% of the entity. The entity can make this 754 election and step up the inside tax basis of the assets and therefore start to deduct goodwill or other assets that are inside the entity. You can't do that in a C Corp or an S corporation. LLCs are considered a very, very popular alternative to the family limited partnership. And again, because they offer certain advantages under the estate planning rules, which we'll talk about in greater detail at the end, they can be very compelling entities. So why do we use it? Limited liability protection. Now, one word about limited liability protection. If I set up an LLC and I own 100%, that's known as a single member LLC. Or if I have a company, set up an LLC as a subsidiary. That LLC is a single member LLC owned by my company. When I own it or my company owns 100%, as a single member LLC, it's normally, the general rule is that it's disregarded for income tax purposes. And when you disregard the entity, it's as if it doesn't exist for income tax purposes. In a couple of bankruptcy courts around the country, Florida and Ohio to be specific, the bankruptcy courts have looked through the single member LLCs to allow a creditor to go after the owner, the member of the LLC, because it was a single member LLC. So in many cases where liability protection is really important and you're concerned about potential effects of bankruptcy in the future, you want to add another member. You can add a family member, you can add a trust for a family member. But if you add another member, you've got two or more members. And as long as you're following the formalities 
of the LLC statutes and your operating agreement to operate the LLC. It should be respected even in bankruptcy courts. The LLC is a chameleon for income tax purposes. What do I mean by that? If I'm a single member LLC, I set up my own LLC to do consulting or whatever I'm doing. It's treated as a disregarded entity, but I can elect to tax the LLC as a different kind of entity. A disregarded LLC can elect to be treated as a C corporation or an S corporation, which is kind of cool. So it gives you flexibility in your choice of entity. You also, if you're a partnership normally, because you have two or more members and you're an LLC, the default treatment is partnership treatment. But a partnership that's an LLC can be electing to be treated as an S corporation or a C corporation. So there's tremendous flexibility and therefore the LLC in fact is a chameleon for federal income tax purposes. And again, for estate and gift tax purposes, if I took a piece of my LLC and I gave it to a family member or I gave it to a trust for the benefit of a family member, I can claim a valuation discount under current law of as much as 35 or 40% of that interest, even though it owns an asset that has a value of say $10 million. If I could discount it by 35%, that valuation discount is worth three and a half million dollars and the tax benefit to my heirs is 40 percent of that amount or 1.4 million dollars that's a lot of protection and so you know that's something to think about when you're doing your estate planning particularly if you're in a higher estate planning bracket now let's talk about the requirements of an llc The LLC statutes from state to state vary, but when the LLC came into existence back in 87 and it started to be formulated in all the various states, like in Virginia, it was enacted in 1995. We had a special set of rules under the income tax rules that examined whether the entity, even though it's an LLC or a partnership, should be treated as a corporation, a C corporation. And those rules were kind of funny and hard to get around. So the statutes that came out to enact the LLC provisions in each state were patterned after the Uniform Limited Partnership Act, which created a vehicle to automatically treat the LLC as a partnership for tax purposes so that there was no ambiguity on that issue. And so people were often afraid when they'd set up these limited partnerships and LLCs, whether or not it was gonna be treated as a corporation for tax purposes. All of that went by the wayside in 1997, when the IRS and the Treasury Department enacted the so-called check the box regulations. In the check the box regulations, the IRS, surprisingly, made it easier for people to choose how they wanted an LLC to be taxed. If you wanted it to be taxed as a partnership and you had two or more people who owned, who were members of the entity, it's automatic. But if you wanted to treat the LLC as an S corporation, you simply had to file a form 2553 with the Internal Revenue Service within a certain period of time after you formed the entity or after the beginning of the calendar year in which you wanted to be treated as an S-Corp. And you file that form and all of a sudden, the LLC goes from being treated as a partnership to an S-Corporation. Same thing for disregarded entities, okay? So that's the origin of these statutes and they were bulletproof, meaning that they were automatically treating the entity as a partnership or flexible 
versus hybrid, which allowed you more flexibility in how you structured your entity. And again, the check the box regulations made these statutes kind of superfluous or unnecessary to deal with that issue because you can now just file a form and check the box and treat your entity however you want it treated. Every LLC in every state in, and the District of Columbia, Columbia must file a form to be recognized in that jurisdiction as a limited liability company. The standard name for that form is Articles of, of Organization as opposed to Articles of Incorporation. They're Articles of Organization. In Delaware, it's called a Certificate of Formation. And in, in a couple other states, it has different names, but they're all basically the same. It gives the name of the entity. It says where your registered agent is located and who that agent is. I'll get into that in a second. And most importantly, it lays out what the purposes of the LLC are and the powers are. And typically, we just use the most broad powers, the broadest powers we can possibly think of. In other words, anything that LLCs can be formed uh, for under the state statute is what the purpose of the LLC is. And the powers are incorporated by reference from the statute. Now, all of this can be modified and made more specific in something called an operating agreement or limited liability company agreement, which we'll focus on in a second. And again, LLCs have members, not shareholders. They can be called anything, but you typically don't refer to them as shareholders because it confuses the nomenclature that's used for corporations. Shareholders own stock in corporations. Members own membership interests, sometimes referred to as units, in LLCs. Okay, so that's something to keep in the back of your mind when you're reading about LLCs and you're setting up your own. LLCs, because they're typically treated as partnerships when there are two, more, two or more owners, has a concept known as capital contributions and capital accounts. That's a partnership tax term. And we use it so that we can identify what money is being actually contributed to the entity and treat it as part of the equity of the entity. When you contribute money to the equity of the entity, it's the last money to come out upon a liquidation or complete dissolution of the entity. Creditors are before the capital or equity owners. And if you've got preferred equity owners, which you can use in a partnership, LLC taxed as a partnership, they get paid next. And then after the LLCs are uh, uh, distribute money to the preferred shareholders or preferred members, then the common members can receive it. Is there a question, Kat, that's pending? Um, we do have one after the next slide, but I can launch it now if you'd like. No, is there a question in the Q&A? Is that something, I see a, a note up there. Oh, let's see. Can you talk about an LLC's liability for either FICA or SE taxes on compensation to paid members? Okay, well, you've just raised a, raised a really good issue, whoever asked that question. First of all, if you have a member of an LLC, and it's treated as a partnership for tax purposes. You're not allowed to pay compensation, if you will, in the form of a W-2 uh, compensation. It's not allowed. The IRS, since 1969, has ruled that first limited partnerships, limited partners of limited partnerships, and now members of LLCs cannot be treated as employees for income tax purposes or employment tax purposes. It's a crazy rule. Its origins are obscure, obscure at best, but that's the IRS's position. So if I own a piece of the LLC, I cannot pay myself a W-2 because I'm treated as a partner 
for tax purposes. And the same thing goes if it's a self-employed or sole proprietorship. If I elect to be treated as an S corp, then I can pay myself W-2 wages. And this gets into the question of, well, how do you shelter income in an LLC for the owners from FICA, which is the social security tax, or self-employment tax, which is the parallel to the social security tax? And the answer is, if you're a member, again, you can't pay yourself comp. And so all of your income is going to be subject to self-employment tax, all the profits, essentially. If you elect S status, you can pay yourself a salary, and then any income in excess of your salary, any profits that are left over, arguably, not definitely, but arguably can be taken out with having, without having to pay FICA tax or Medicare tax, or self-employment tax for that matter. So that's, that's a really important fact for people who are setting up LLCs and operating businesses or even you know, conducting investment activities and trying to pay yourself a salary out of the LLC. Now, what do people do in that instance? Often what we'll do is we'll have the LLC be the operating entity and we could set up another LLC either as a subsidiary or as a, an owner of the LLC to allow employees to receive equity of the equity entity that owns a piece of the LLC. So you're separating the entity into two pieces, one an equity owner, and the other is a situation where you're not deemed to be the member of the operating LLC. You might be a, an employee in that instance, and your equity is owned through a, either a subsidiary or through a parent entity usually. So that's the basics of the requirements, but that's it. You don't have to have bylaws. You don't have to have stock certificates or unit certificates or certificates for the membership interest. You simply have to file articles of organization and you must keep books and records for the LLC. QuickBooks is a fine way to do it or some other accounting software package. And then again, do you need an operating agreement? And the answer generally is you should have an operating agreement. It's not required by law because in the absence of an operating agreement, the statutes control what happens in the LLC, which may be good and it may be bad. It could be bad because some statutes in some states say that if you, the member, die owning your LLC, the LLC is automatically terminated. How do we get around these statutory quirks? We create an operating agreement that allows us to make exceptions to what the statutes in the states provide. And so the operating agreement acts like a set of bylaws, but also acts like a shareholder's agreement. It's a, it's a document that governs how the LLC will be operated and managed. And one of the things we often do in an operating agreement is we distinguish between the members, the owners, and the people responsible for managing the business, the managers. You can have someone serve as the manager of the business which is like a board of directors and an officer, because a manager can do both. Again, it's flexible. You can define it to mean anything, but managers can be like a board of directors. They can be officers. They can be both. They can run the whole show, but they don't have to be members. They don't have to be members of the entity. And so that's kind of cool because if they're not a member, but they're a manager, you might provide some additional liability insulation. And the manager doesn't have to be an individual. It can be another LLC or an irrevocable trust or a corporation. So to provide super protection on the asset liability front, we will usually recommend that our clients use manager-managed LLCs, and the operating agreement is where that's 
decided. The operating agreement also talks about voting or non-voting units or membership interests, or whether or not somebody has super voting privileges, like 10 to 1 voting rights. It'll talk about how to allocate profits and losses. So one of the things that we come up against in the partnership setting is that in a partnership, LLC taxed as a partnership, you may be contributing money and you may have a partner that's just rendering services. When you contribute money, you get an increase in your capital account in the LLC. And that enables you to claim losses for tax purposes. The partnership regulations that apply to LLCs taxed as partnerships say that. So if you've put in money or you've borrowed money and, and guaranteed it personally, or you've lent money to the entity, you get income tax basis that you can use to absorb any losses. The rules also say that if you've taken losses in the past, they want you to recapture those losses by allocating profits to those who claim the losses first before splitting up profits and losses on the percentage ownership in the entity, okay? It talks about when and how new members can be admitted. Some of the state statutes require unanimous consent of all the members to allow a new member to come into the entity. That may be too burdensome or too restrictive depending on your entity, or it may be exactly what you want. But these are things that you can modify in the operating agreement. Importantly, the operating agreement talks about how a member can transfer his or her interests. And let me digress for one second. The corporate laws, the common laws, partnership law, basically say in so many words that you cannot absolutely prohibit a member from transferring his or her interest in an LLC. That's a prohibited restraint on alienation is what they call it. And it may not be enforced under the laws of the state in which you're operating. So to get around that, you build in provisions in the operating agreement that allow you to control who the units or who the membership interests can be transferred to. One of the big issues in family LLCs is they don't necessarily want people who are outside the family, including people who are not blood relatives, from acquiring an ownership interest in the entity, which is one of the reasons why we use trusts to own the ownership interests or so the membership interests in the entity so that it can regulate who becomes an owner of the entity. Another way of regulating the ownership is if a member has the right to sell his or her interest to a third party, we give the LLC a right of first refusal to buy their interest before they can sell it outside the family unit or outside the unit of owners that we've assembled to operate the LLC. That right of first refusal also may be delegated to the members called a right of second refusal. But these are restrictions on transfer that are enforceable under the law, okay? So the operating agreement is where we typically include these provisions. And lastly, in the operating agreement, we talk about under what circumstances will the LLC dissolve? As I mentioned earlier, some state statutes require the dissolution of the LLC on the death of a member. Well, that's not necessarily what you intended to do. So how do you avoid that? You put provisions in your operating agreement that say, number one, the LLC is to last in perpetuity if you want it to, or some long period of time, which you used to not be able to do with limited partnerships. LLCs can last in perpetuity in virtually every state. And the second thing you do is you say 
expressly that the LLC does not dissolve or liquidate on the death of a member. If there's one member left, it doesn't even have to dissolve then because the estate of the member or the trust of the member can then acquire ownership of the LLC and continue operating it, okay? All right, Wayne, we do have our second poll. All righty. How many of you with LLCs have signed operating agreements for each LLC? Select one, yes, no, or not sure. <laughs> All right, and the results. So 20% of you who are answering, because there's a lot more people on the, uh, on the seminar, some of you are bashful, I guess, or not listening or pretending to listen. Some of you have said, one of you have said, no, I've done it for every LLC I've ever formed. 80% have said no. And I would encourage you to have an operating agreement for two reasons. Number one, even if it's a single member operating agreement, you want to have an, a, a single member LLC. You want to have an operating agreement because your investment advisor, your financial planner, your bank will want to see it typically. Number two, it adds to the sanctity of the LLC. In other words, it has rules governing the LLC, which again, I think help in sustaining an argument against a creditor who's trying to pierce through your limited liability shield to protect you. All right, Wayne, we did have one comment from a attendee that just mentioned I, some did not answer because they have not formed yeah, an LLC. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> I, I just pulled it up. Yeah, that, that's fine. Good. Um, if you haven't formed it yet, then you don't need an operating agreement. But when you form it, it, it is a good idea to consider doing that. So let's look at a mining example. This is a great illustration done by my uh, uh, graphic designer, Adabombo. He does a great job with our, our slides and everything. It's very cool. Let's have an example where 10 unrelated investors are considered considering establishing a joint venture to acquire and develop a mining property in one of the Western states, let's say it's Wyoming. And it's an extremely risky and potentially dangerous operation. But if it's successful, it's gonna generate huge profits. And if it's not, the investors will experience significant losses, perhaps the entire loss of their investment. The mining operation could result in considerable liability to its owners, both for debts incurred in operations and potential damages to any adjacent property or injuries that workers sustain. While insurance may be available to cover some of these risks, it may not be sufficient to cover the potential exposure. So the investors could form an S-corp, assuming they're all qualified shareholders to own S-Corp shares, and they could achieve limited liability and pass through of profits and most losses in an S-Corp. But they may find that the S-Corp structure is too limiting. Under their proposed arrangement, some participants may want to share in profits and losses unequally, and an S-Corporation only is allowed to have one class of stock, voting and non-voting stock, with no allocation of profits and losses, especially to one owner or another. They can't use a general partnership because they would all be personally liable for all of the claims made against the entity and the lawsuits. And they can't use a limited partnership, or they shouldn't, because no participant may be willing to assume the role of general partner, although they could use a corporation to serve as the general partner and limit the liability of everyone. The LLC in this example allows all members to achieve limited liability, at least to the uh, beyond their investment promise 
to the entity and participate in the venture actively or delegate management. And the LLC allows the owners to create different classes of ownership, say a preferred stock or preferred unit ownership and participation. And also at the same time, allow full pass through of profits and losses. So mining a company is not the only example I would use here. Real estate is a classic entity if it's rental real estate, particularly commercial rental, but even residential rental, you would want to put it into an LLC if you can. So let's talk about some of the tax quirks associated with LLCs, some of the opportunities, and some of the downsides. One of the things we have to look at under the check the box regulations to determine how the entity is gonna be taxed are three questions. Is the entity separate and apart from its owners? If so, is it a trust or a business entity? A trust by statute and by common law is created when somebody grants ownership legal title of property to a trustee for the benefit of somebody else. A business entity is a corporation, a partnership, or an LLC. And if it's a business entity, is the entity formed as a corporation? If it's formed as a corporation, its default status is to be treated as a C corporation unless it can elect otherwise. The check the box rules say if it's not formed as a corporation, the entity, whether it's a disregarded entity, single member or partnership, two or more members, can elect to be treated as any kind of entity. State law, unfortunately, does not follow the federal rules exactly. In fact, a number of states have started to require mandatory withholding at the LLC level and estimated tax payments, even though the entity is treated as a pass-through entity. Virginia has a required withholding, uh, withholding requirement for non-residents. Ohio has its own commercial activities tax. Michigan has a business tax. And even Texas, which doesn't even tax income for individuals, has something called a margin tax at the entity level. Most states conform to the federal entity classification rules, meaning that if the entity is treated as a partnership for federal purposes, it'll generally be treated as a partnership for state income tax purposes. But it doesn't always apply. For example, Arkansas will follow the federal rules if you file a special election in Arkansas. Georgia will let your S corporation, your LLC that's taxed as an S corporation for federal purposes, be treated as a Georgia S corporation only if all of the owners are subject to tax in Georgia on their share of the corporate income or the LLC income, or all non-resident owners pay Georgia income tax. New York and New Jersey have separate elections and Pennsylvania allows you to opt out of S corporation treatment by filing a special form. So the state treatment complicates the way in which your entity will be treated. And so if you're formed in Delaware, you're formed in Virginia, but you're operating in multiple states like many of our clients do, who own and operate LLCs, whether it's taxed as an S corp or a partnership, you'd better have a good CPA on board who understands the state income tax treatment and filing requirements so you, you don't generate unnecessary income tax treatment. And again, some states like DC imposes tax on LLCs in the form of a franchise tax. So watch out. 
DC's franchise tax, by the way, does not apply to professional services providers who are uh, rendering at least 80% of the services they provide are professional services. They don't have to pay that separate unincorporated business franchise tax. So S corporations and LLCs are often confused. And the question that we got at the very beginning about whether LLCs have to pay FICA or uh, self-employment tax, it's really not the LLC that has to pay it. It's the member that has to pay it, number one. And number two, if you have an LLC that's electing S corp status, that may be one of the benefits of having an S corporation over an LLC tax as a partnership. So does it avoid double, double taxation? That's the first question I always ask. And in an S corporation, you can have corporate level tax in a couple of cases. For example, if you converted from a C corporation to an S corporation, you may have what's called built-in gains tax. And if, if that occurs, it occurs within five years of the conversion from a C corp to an S corp. LLC, tax as a partnership, there's no double taxation, except perhaps again at the state level. So watch out for that. By the way, California has a one and a half percent tax on uh, certain pass-through entities. Can you pass through losses in an LLC that's taxed as a partnership? Absolutely. If the LLC is taxed as an S corp or if it's an S corp, usually, but not always. The rules are not exactly the same. S corps can have up to 100 owners. Husbands and wives are not considered the same taxpayer for this purpose. LLCs can have a million owners, but then you start getting into federal securities law re reporting requirements. So be careful about that. Who can be an owner of an S corp? Only resident individuals, non-resident aliens are not allowed to be owners of S corps, estates and only certain trusts and of course, 501c3 organizations also can own S-corps, but usually they don't because it triggers unrelated business income tax taxable at the highest corporate rate. LLCs can have any kind of owner, can have foreign owners, domestic owners, can have trusts of any kind. Not, it's not limited to certain types of trust. As I mentioned, losses can pass through, but there may be limitations. And so the limitation on the ability of an S-corp owner is limited to his or her income tax basis in the stock plus loans they've made to the corporation. But you cannot claim income tax basis for loans that are made to the corporation by a third party. It's very limited under those circumstances. And in, in an LLC taxed as a partnership, it's basically, it allows more flexibility in borrowing from outside third-party sources and claiming the losses and letting them pass through or lending the money yourself or contributing the money yourself as a capital contribution. And then lastly, in an S-Corp, only one type of stock is allowed to be issued. It's common stock. That means that everybody participates in S-Corporation earnings and distributions based on their percentage ownership, period. There cannot be any variance in that. If you have a second class of stock, you've inadvertently terminated your S-corp status. You can have voting and non-voting common stock. That's one exception to the two class of stock prohibition. LLCs can do anything. LLCs can have preferred unit interests, preferred ownership interests, and common ownership interests. They can have two or more classes of ownership interests. They can have voting and non-voting. They can do anything. It's the ultimate flexible structure. All right, Wayne, we do have our last poll question. How many of you have been advised by our accountants or others to use LLC? By your, it's really by your accountants, sorry. <laughs> S-corporation, LLC taxed as an S-corporation, or a C corporation. 
All right, and here are the results. So four out of six, two thirds of you said LLC. One said S Corp. <clears throat> One said LLC taxed as an S Corp, which may mean the same thing. And nobody said C Corp. So let me give you some guidance on choice of entity, which is valuable guidance because not a lot of people understand this. And in fact, I think some of the accountants are a bit uh, black and white on this. Didactic is the term I use. I was accused of that by uh, one of uh, my partners uh, in early on in my law career. He said, don't be didactic like because you're a CPA. Be flexible in your thinking. Think in the alternative. I said, okay, what does didactic mean? I had to go look it up. And that was about 32 years, 36 years ago when he said that to me. And I've, I've kept that in my mind ever since. He burned a, an impression in my mind. But C-Corps are useful if you're going to seek outside investment from third parties, whether it's from an institutional investor, like a venture capitalist or a private equity firm, whether it's from an angel investor, it could be an individual or an IRA or a tax exempt entity, C-Corps are the preferred structure. And setting them up in Delaware is also a preferred state in which to set that up. Another reason to use a C-Corporation is if you qualify for this uh, exclusion from the sale of stock from capital gains tax. It's called the 1202 Qualified Small Business Stock Exclusion, which I've talked about in the past. If you qualify for that, you can exclude up to $10 million of gain from long-term capital gains tax or more, depending on how you have everything structured. You can leverage that up way up and it can be uh, a very significant benefit. And I've had many clients utilize that. But LLCs to start up are great. And LLCs treated as a partnership or a disregarded entity usually is the way we started out. All right. So I was mentioning earlier about estate planning using LLCs. And this is a cool structure that we've used for some of our clients typically who are high net worth, but as the exemptions drop from the federal estate tax and gift tax, at the end of 2025, many people who were not worried about estate tax will be worried about it because they dropped by half. And it could be six, $7 million per person at that time. And if you have more than that, or you're going to generate more than that over your lifetime because of the businesses that you're building or the assets that you're accruing or, or investing in, that's, this is a technique to keep in the back of your mind. Step one is we take your assets, real estate, cash, investments, business assets, and first we put them into your revocable trust to avoid probate if we can. The second step, and again, this doesn't have to be done this way. It could be just you, you know, the husband, the wife might just set up your own LLC and it might work better under tax law. Uh, as I get into this, I'll describe why. Let's say we take some assets and we put it into a limited liability company and we'll call it a family LLC. And we get back in exchange for the assets that we put in an LLC interest. That's a non-taxable event under the Internal Revenue Code. If it's treated as a partnership or as a disregarded entity, it's a non-taxable event. Just as contributing your assets to your revocable trust is not taxable for income tax purposes. So now we've got an LLC set up. We've got limited liability. We've got a bunch of assets in there. One of the questions I always get is, shouldn't I put everything in there? And the answer is no, absolutely not. You should have assets outside of the LLC that you can live on for the rest of your life. And the IRS looks at this because if they see that you've contributed all of your assets, your personal residence, your vacation homes, all of your investments, everything into your LLC so that you can try to achieve certain tax benefits or asset protection benefits, they will disregard the entity for tax purposes, at least. And it may create problems on the asset protection side too. So you want to have assets outside 
And you usually take your investments and business assets and you put them into the LLC and keep some investment assets out so you can live on them. Now, step three is a bit complicated. If we just look at it from the standpoint, and it should be, uh, should be H's revocable trust on the top and W's revocable trust on the bottom. I didn't catch that in the uh, review of the slides. H is on the top, W's on the bottom. Let's say husband wants to set up a trust for the benefit of his wife. He can do that. And he can take a piece of this LLC and either gift it or sell it to the trust. And if we set up the trust as what we call a grantor trust, the sale is disregarded for income tax purposes. In other words, a grantor trust is treated as if you own the asset yourself, just as it's the revocable trust is treated as if you own the assets directly yourself. But what this is doing is it's allowing us to move wealth and appreciation on that wealth out of our estates and into the hands of our spouse and future generations without incurring estate tax on our death or on our spouse's death or even on the deaths of our kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids. That's why it's referred to often as a dynasty trust. The SLAT, the Spousal Lifetime Access Trust, allows the spouse not only to serve as a trustee of the trust, but to get access to the assets in the trust under certain limitations. Here's an example. Let's say we contribute $10 million of assets into our LLC from our revocable trusts. And then we turn around and gift significant percentage of the LLC to each of our slats, my, hus my husband or my wife, we do this in two separate transactions. The first major warning I must give you is you do not do this at the same time, ever. You don't do it at the same time. You shouldn't do it in the same taxable year. Because again, the IRS will look at it and say, wait, wait a second, you're just transferring assets that you held individually into a trust for your spouse's benefit, and they're doing the same for you all at the same time. We're going to disregard the whole thing as a sham. The other thing is the, the slats, the dynasty trusts, have to be different. The IRS took that all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court in the U.S. versus Grace case back in 1968, and they won that case, saying that because these trusts were identical, they were able to disregard the trusts in their entirety. So two things, separate in terms of time and separate in terms of what the trusts say. If you do that, watch what happens. I transferred 10 million into the trust. I moved 98% of that over time out to these two slats. I put it into the LLC. I moved 98% of the LLC out to the two slats. I went out and got an appraisal each time I did this, and I got a discount of 35% from a bona fide qualified appraiser who rendered a, a report to me that says I'm entitled to claim a discount for the transfer of the LLC interest, even though I still control the LLC. The IRS has tried to fight this for years, but they've lost several cases on this front. And as long as you structure everything properly, and I'm not going to get into all the nuances of it, but if you structure everything properly and do it right, that 35% discount in this case is worth almost $1,400,000. Because the discount is worth $3.5 98% of 3.5 million or 3 point, uh, 4, 4.9 million, 49% of 10 million each interest or 9.8 million times 
uh, one minus 35%. That's what the discount is worth. So in this case, each gift is worth 3.185 million or 6.3 million and change. Multiply that times 40%. That's your tax savings to your heirs. Why wouldn't you do this? You would do this if you expect your estate after the death of the surviving spouse, after spending everything you're going to spend it on, and you've spent it, not bought other assets, is above at least one exemption, you're going to want to think about doing these types of transactions. You can do this in a gift, or you can do it in a sale. If you do it in a sale, and you structure the trust as a grantor trust, you might have to do a gift to the trust initially of at least 10% of the value of what the note coming back from the slat is going to equal. So you're selling an interest in the LLC to the slat. You're getting a promissory note back. You're making a small gift to the slat to fund the slat so it has assets. And you can create a note that might last as long as 15 or 20 years into the future, and it might not be required to pay you interest. The interest rate back in October was 1.7%. Today, it's over twice that amount. It has doubled since October. So it's about 3.6% today. It's still a low interest rate, and people are still doing these transactions. When the interest rates rise too high so that you can't earn more than what the interest rate is, it may not make as much sense to use this type of a transaction. So I thought I'd give you an idea of how LLCs can really be leveraged through valuation discounting to move assets out of your estate and save taxes. A slat. And base in, in essence is you're moving an asset into a trust for the benefit of your spouse. The spouse has access for her health, education, maintenance, and support for the rest of his or her life. And at his or her death, it goes in trust to the children and grandchildren, or the kids and grandkids can participate on day one with the spouse, depending on how you structure it. What questions, if any, do we have from the audience on any of this stuff that we've talked about today? No Anybody questions. have any questions? Well, we will make this, uh, sl these slides available to you and to the public and the recording will be available as well. So in case any of you signed up for this and missed it, uh, you're not listening to it today, but you'll have access to it and Kat, uh, we'll get your information, or if you want to share this with somebody that you know would benefit from hearing this uh, presentation, please feel free to share it. We just need your email address so that we can contact you and give you access so that you can do that. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, have, have given this presentation to you today on LLCs. LLCs are very cool. You should definitely consider using them in all aspects of what you're doing. And um, tune in next time. What is our next Lunch and Learn, Kat? Our next one is September 14th, and it is when should I use an S corporation to run my business? We're probably going to reschedule that one because I'm not going to be around. So we will definitely reschedule that one. I'll be in Italy at that time. So. Um, we're going to need to move that one out probably a week to the 21st of September. All right. We'll be sending that out. All of you participating will be getting that email as well. Awesome. All righty. Thank you all for participating today. Have a great day and uh, we'll talk to you soon. And by the way, don't forget to refer us to your friends, neighbors, colleagues, clients. We love your referrals. We really appreciate them. And we really appreciate your participating in this lunch and learn today.